I forgot to mention during the announcements, uh, after last week, Bill Pemberton came up to me. Uh, we were praying for law enforcement, and he said, we should do something. And as a preacher, I said, we should. That's the way I usually respond. Yes, we should. It's something that's worth doing. We should do something. As I thought about it, I thought, what would I want? And the thing that came across my mind is a steak dinner. That's what I'd like, a steak dinner with some potatoes. And guess what? Uh, on the 28th of this month, we'll be hosting a dinner here for the sheriffs, the police, the fire department, the first responders. Uh, Well, I can see you appreciate it, so you can come help, serve. <laughs> Glad you're on board. Uh, and I said all this and announced it and called the police department and, and got everybody invited and then set out, out maybe raising some money. Uh, we've raised most of it already, but you're welcome to give and we'll find an appropriate way with any money we have left over uh, to make sure that it's received. Well, our reading today is uh, the lectionary text, the book of James, a continuation of where we left off, and a book of Mark. In James, it starts with how we should treat poor and wealthy, that we should not treat them differently, that if you break one part of the law, then you break all of it, and then faith without works is dead. There's not too fine of a point put on that one. Faith without works is dead. The reading from Mark is a little bit more problematic. It is the treatment of a Syrophoenician woman, that is, a non-Jewish lady by Jesus. Well, let's press into the text this morning. From the book of James, the second chapter. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorification of Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partialism, your commitment to sin and convicted by the law as a transgressor, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who says you shall not commit adultery also says, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And what good is it, my brother and sister, if you say you have faith, but you don't have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. And from the book of Mark, the seventh chapter, starting with the 24th verse. From there he set out, and went away to the region of Tyre. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin, and she begged him to cast the demon out of his daughter, out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. 
So she went home and found a child lying on the bed and the demon gone. He then returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee and the region of Decapolis. They brought him out a deaf man who had an impeachment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. And he took him aside privately, away from the crowd, and put his fingers in his ear and spat and touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephem, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealous they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. The way we treat other people says more about us than it does about them. I find this to be a truth. The way I treat other people, the way that we treat other people, says a whole lot about who I am, and it says a whole lot more about who I am than they, uh, who they are. One, one of the principles I found as I followed Christ, the following of Jesus, if spiritual formation is true, then we're being ever more formed into the likeness of Christ. Uh, we grow and we become more like Him, and as we do, we should be changed. No longer like the world, but thinking like Christ does. And so as we change, we should behave better. We should have works that go along with that. While I was doing prison ministry, uh, we were doing a Kairos weekend, and we had a man, rather large fellow. He was the leader of one of the major gangs in the Dallas area. He was a powerful man within the gangs. And he converted to Christianity. And upon giving his testimony, he was very excited. He got up there and he said, I want every one of you Christians to know, I want you all to know that I've got your back, and if any business needs to be taken care of, I'll take care of it. I wanted to take him aside and say, I appreciate the enthusiasm. You know, God bless you for the passion. I could use some church members with that passion, but we really don't go around taking care of business although we might want to, right? We we, we don't go and we don't murder people. That's not what it is to be a Christian. Uh, Now, it doesn't take you long to figure out what has happened, right? He's decided to move from one gang to another gang that just happens to be led by Jesus. He's joined a new gang. Uh, Now, we all understand immediately what has happened is, is he hasn't fully embraced the ethics of Christianity. Right? He hasn't fully embraced the ethics of Christianity because to follow Christ is to get Christ into us and we no longer follow the world. Now, I'd like to point out something. The difference between what he has done and what we have done is a matter of degree. Do you follow me? It's just a matter of degree. Have we really washed the world out of us and become the Christian body? Or are we just bringing the world into the church? It's a harsh question. The answer is, is all too often, we just bring the world's ethics into the church and we continue to live that way, thinking that somehow that it's Christian and we just, it's just covered, it's all okay. And one of them is pointed out in today's text, this the way we treat Wealthy people versus the way we treat poor people. And it's a spiritual truth. And here's the underlying issue on the whole spiritual truth. It's this. We treat rich people well because we think we might get something out of it. And we treat poor people badly because we don't think they have anything we need. Or maybe y'all are in a different place. Y'all follow me? We, We treat wealthy people well because we think when they come in, there's something that maybe we can get out of this relationship, and poor people don't have anything. And James points out a truth here. Uh, Did you forget? It's the poor 
whom Jesus has chosen, and they have great faith. What you need is faith. You don't need so much stuff. We, 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 get these, we get these backwards because we've imported the world into the church as opposed to importing the church in, into the world. And so we forget this, and we're not always constantly being formed by this. Now, what ends up happening, unfortunately, for wealthy people is they end up kind of taking it on the chin for some of this. You think the, the poor are often the victim of this, but I think all too often the wealthy may be a victim of this as well. One of my favorite preaching professors used to say, every Sunday there are people in your church who are hurting and broken and in a difficult place. And I'm going to add, that, I'm going to add this to it. Even wealthy people. Just because you have money or you have means or you have things, it does not mean that you haven't had people die in your life. You haven't had cancer. You haven't had brokenness. You haven't had hurts. And, and if people come into your church that way and you, you descend upon them always seeking something, we have diminished what the church's role is and we've diminished Christ and what Christ can do for us. We're chasing the wrong stuff. There's a man I know who's wealthy, and he says, I don't, and, it, and it's not this church, it's a church far away from here, but I know where it is. He says, I don't like to go to church because every time I go to church, people are there and they're meeting and they're greeting me and they want something. They, they want something from me constantly. So he has no place to go to church. We've robbed him of a place to worship. It's similar to a friend I had in the woodlands who was an electrician. He said, I don't like to go to church because they know I'm an electrician and they want me to rewire the church. Don't worry, this week is nominations, so if you've got any skills, I'll be calling you to do something in the church, but that's different, right? But we, we, we do that. We, we don't view the world from a spiritual standpoint. We view it and we're always trying to get something, and we think once we get it, once we obtain, once we get someplace, then our problems will be cured. Our problems aren't always our circumstances, it's how we view them. So we're in this broken place. We don't treat people equally. We, we treat them badly, and so how we treat the stranger, how we treat people from another country, how we treat people from a different nation, how we treat people with different views, that says a lot about who we are more than it says about who they are. So as a spiritual maturity, we need to be invited to grow. We need to be invited to change out of that. And what's interesting is that the text is pretty clear for us in James, and then I get... Right on the heels of this, Jesus. Uh, and this is what I would call a tricky passage. Have y'all read this passage before where Jesus uh, basically calls a group of people dogs? Are, are, you, are you catching this? This is not what I would call the politically correct gospel. Are you following me? Uh, he's, man, I'm like, wow, Jesus, did you just really do this? Because now I've got to deal with Jesus not treating everybody the same. It's the job of a preacher. Sometimes, you do such a good job on the children's sermon. I wanted to mention this. The children's sermon is harder than my sermon every week. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but she makes it look easy. I want you to know doing a simple, quick message is harder than getting 20 minutes. And you guys are going, 20 minutes? Are you sure, preacher? <laughs> so, Here's the issue with Jesus. Maybe if I retold the story, this would, would help you with the story. Everything is involved in the context of what's going on. Now, you may not have noticed it, but between Matthew and Mark, you can put together the whole story. And what has taken place is Jesus has gone on retreat with the disciples. They've had a rough few weeks. They've been battered by the religious teachers. They've been out doing ministry. And it's time for the religious to go on holiday. And they've gone out of the country away from other Jewish people, and they've gone to hide in a house. They've, they've gone on retreat. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but this last week I was just on retreat up at Lakeview. And, you know, you go on retreat, and it's a great thing for preachers. Uh, you need to get a little time away so you can get, you know, some idea about what you might want to preach on. And so we were doing some personality testing. I want to let you all in on some of my quirks in case you don't know them yet. Apparently, 
uh, after getting my test back, I like people. I'm a people person. I didn't know if you knew that or not. I'm a people person. Uh, I also apparently have an issue with being blunt. Have y'all noticed this? I read that and I'm like, really? Hmm, who knew? Uh, But the other problem I have, I have this kind of snap response. If I've had enough people for enough time, I need to be away for a while. Uh, Anybody ever been there? You've just had enough people for enough and it's time to get away for a little while. I see a few people laughing. Y'all are feeling me, aren't you? It's like, if I have one more person, they're going to find out how the cow ate the cabbage, right? Right now. So it, it's good to get away. So here Jesus is on retreat, and I don't know Jesus' personality. I don't know if he's in this camp. But he's gone away on retreat. He's got his disciples are in retreat. And here this lady is yelling over the fence. We can tell that from the other gospel. She's yelling over the fence, Jesus, son of David. She's yelling away. And you can just picture the disciples. They're all looking at Jesus going, are you going to do something? Because this isn't very retreatful, buddy. Yeah, she's been out there yelling all day. What are you going to do? Because we wanted some retreat time, Jesus. You you can just picture this, right? She's like, well, let her in. Let her in and we'll see what she wants. She comes in and she makes a request. Remove a demon from my daughter. Simple request. Now, what what you need to know is to, to take care of this request, Jesus will have to put down what he's doing because to cast out a demon in their society, you need to go and be in the presence of the demon. So Jesus is on retreat time feeding his disciples, and here somebody is trying to drag him away from his primary mission of what he's doing. And so what does he do? He looks at her, and this is something Jesus often does. He looks around, he sees something in the local area, and he gives a visual lesson of what's going on. He looks around and says, it's not good to take away the food from the children, which is the children that he's teaching right there, the disciples. And I'm sure there are some puppy dogs, their house dogs, which is what they're referred to in the Greek, and to give their food to the puppies. There's a time to feed puppies and there's a time to feed the people. There's a time for each of these things. Surely you can follow this. Now, you, you've got to love her response because she's just brilliant. I think anybody who sticks with, like if you start an analogy and the other person picks the analogy up and stretches it, don't you like that? I mean, you're like, okay, they're playing, you know, they're with me, they're following me, they're tracking. And she looks at the whole story. She looks at the illustration and she says to Jesus, look, I don't need the whole meal, just some crumbs. And don't the puppies get the crumbs? a brilliant answer because what she's saying in that is is i have the faith that you can do this it's no big deal you can make this happen to which jesus's response is he's astounded he's amazed he looks and he goes i haven't seen this kind of faith in the whole land we just came from one of the big problems we've got what there's this lack of faith what does she have she has all kinds of faith What's interesting about this retreat is, you know, the retreat I just went on, there was a lesson that went along with the whole retreat. What was the lesson of this retreat? Why don't we hear about the lesson of the retreat? I don't think we hear the lesson because this is the lesson. She was the example. She was the teaching. And the teaching is this. She had faith. She showed up. She opened the plastic deal. She got the glue out. She put it on the pot. She knocked on the door. Now, the reason I'm really sure Jesus isn't racist and has trouble with this issue because on his way out of town, he heals multiple people. And these people are not Jewish people, and the reason we know that is because they live in the Decapolis, which is the name for ten cities, which are Greek cities. Uh, Archaeologists will tell you for sure we know it's not Jewish people because they raised pigs. Jewish people don't raise pigs. So as he went through town, he continued to heal people. What he's saying is, this has a priority over this. And she says, I have faith that you are more. I have faith that you can take care of this. Well, on our retreat, one of the things we we got to do is look at 
What are the things that motivate you as a preacher? What is it that lights your fire, that gets you up in the morning, that makes you want to go to work? Or as one said, what is it that if they didn't even pay you, you would want to do? I know that the SPRC is going to be interested in this part. What is the part that we don't have to pay you to do? I'll tell you right now, you pay me to do the annual reports. That's what you guys pay me for. That is not my favorite part. We get them done, though. They get out. My favorite part has to do with spiritual transformation. When I see people get it, when I see people's life change, when I see them follow Jesus, when I see them spread the word, when I see that happen and leaders developed, that lights my fires. That gets me excited. And that is what this scripture is about. What one of the one of the other people was saying, his part, his favorite part was was when people said the sinner's prayer. When they accepted Jesus into their heart. And that is a wonderful thing. That is a great thing. That is something that needs to happen. But one of the things we always need to remember is if if we invite Jesus into our heart, He's very likely to bring some of His friends. Did you catch that? When we invite Jesus into our heart, He's going to invite other people that may not be like us, that may be in different places, that may think differently, that may be differently. Jesus is going to invite people into our heart that we didn't have in our heart before. And how we treat them says a lot about who we've become. When our son Alex was born, I remember that I never invited him into my heart. But I didn't have to. I didn't have to invite him because he just came right on in. And many of the things he loves and many of the things that he did, you know what? Those things come all along with it. My prayer for you is may Jesus' friends come into your heart as well. May Jesus' friends come into your hearts as well. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.